We have seen that an ellipse can be drawn using a piece of string tied to two fixed pins and we can add the distance between the pins to the string and tie it in a loop for convenience of motion. When I demonstrated this to my daughter when she was in grade 2, she asked me what will happen if we introduce a third pin in that loop and that's the question we'll be investigating in this clip. So let us start with what we know. We have these two pins P1 and P2 at a distance 90 and a loop of string of length 240. So we are going to arrange them like this so that this pencil can move and trace an ellipse like this. So this is the ellipse that we get with that. Now let us introduce the third pin and as you can see it is going to obstruct the string in this position or that position and effectively it is going to alter the length that is actively taking part in the drawing process. So when we go to the other side of P1 and P2, this length say 70 plus 50 equal to 120 units will be locked up in inactive position. So only this much is left for drawing our ellipse. So we will get a different ellipse, a smaller ellipse like this. So this is that ellipse. Although these two ellipses are drawn with two different string lengths, that is to say active string lengths, they still share the two pins or they are going to have the same two foci, P1 and P2. So they are called as confocal ellipses. Since we are going to go around drawing without lifting our pencil, we can expect an unbroken path. But since these two ellipses are not meeting, there must be some path segments that bridge the two. So let us find them now. Let us consider this position of our loop. In that case, pin P3 will just begin to obstruct the string and only this part of the string will be left free to draw. Effectively, P3 and P2 now become the fixed ends of the string, making them the foci of an altogether different ellipse. So this is that ellipse. This transition occurs at an interesting point. Imagine this pencil position connected to the two foci of the green ellipse P1 and P2. But these are the lines which also connect the two foci of the yellow ellipse P3 and P2. And we know if we bisect the angle between the two lines that join the pencil to the two foci, we get a normal. So here we are going to get a normal not only to the green ellipse but also to the yellow ellipse. Since they are drawn with the same pencil, they must be making a contact there. So they are making a contact, they have a common normal, so they must have a common tangent as well. What does it mean? Well, as we go from one ellipse to the other, there is no change of slope and therefore we will not experience any bump. In computer graphics, this is called as the G1 continuity. Let us recap this whole process in top view. We started with two pins P1 and P2 and active loop length of 150, which gave us this ellipse. Then we introduced a third pin, which shortened our active loop length to 120, giving us a smaller but confocal ellipse. Then I'm using a color code for pins P1, P2 on the green line we get these two green ellipses. Similarly, by symmetry, for pins P3, P2 on the yellow line, we will get these two yellow confocal ellipses. And for pins P1, P3 on the red line, we will get these two red confocal ellipses. So in all, we have six ellipses grouped into three confocal pairs. Of course, this looks like a mess. So let us go back to our original triangle and extend its sides thereby dividing our plane into seven zones. Say zone between these two lines over here, then zone between these two lines over here, the third zone, fourth, fifth, sixth, and the seventh zone. Uh, these zones are where the arcs of the ellipse will exist and they will be connected to each other at a point on these lines with tangent continuity. So this is how our final figure looks. These two are the confocal arcs from the green ellipses, these two from the red and so on. 
and I have also written the effective loop lengths that we used for drawing them.